Welcome to the Real View podcast, where Ohio realtors connect you to innovators and influencers, keeping you with the real view of real estate. Whether you're a broker, agent, first time home buyer, industry leader, or just happen to stumble upon our podcast today, you can expect to hear tips, tools, tricks, interesting information, and so much more from the experts in Ohio's real estate game. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of The Real View Podcast. I'm your host, Allison Wiley. Joining me today is our special guest, Dr. Jessica Louts, who is the Vice President of Demographics and Behavioral Insights at the National Association of Realtors, aka NAR. Jessica, thank you so much for joining me today. We are so happy to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super psyched to be here. Yes. Well, Jessica is going to dive into the work that she does at NAR. She's going to share some fascinating information with us just about the trends she's seeing, the insights that, you know, she's gathered from the work that she's done there. So we're really excited to talk to her today. But before we dive into that, we have to ask our signature question. So Jessica, what is the best view that you've ever seen? All right, Allison, you are totally putting me on the spot because this is such a broad (laughs) question. And I feel like I could answer this so many ways. So during the pandemic, I, you know, I've always been a hiker, but I really got into hiking during the pandemic. And it is definitely something that brings me joy. And so I think when I get to the top of a summit and I just see the view and I didn't die going up there and I'm like, oh my God, this was worth it. This was gorgeous. So I think that's probably it. The end of a hike. So the waterfall or the lake or wherever I end up. (laughs) Do you have a favorite hike that you've been on? So I just was hiking in the Poconos for a few weeks and I really enjoyed my time there. And it's just like a park filled with waterfalls, honestly. And so I, at the end of a hike, we went over a million little tiny bridges that were really just logs over water and it was so beautiful. But then at the end was a waterfall and it was really peaceful and it was nice to be there. Oh, that's so beautiful. There's just something about getting out into nature that's just so calming and so good for the soul. Not to mention getting a little activity on a hike is always, always good too. Yes, absolutely. Just lots of bug spray and no ticks, please. (laughs) Yes. And no cicadas. I don't know about, about you guys, but we have been infested with cicadas here in Ohio. And I mean, they have taken over the world here. (laughs) So none of that, hopefully no cicadas on those hikes either, because they are crazy. (laughs) They are. Yeah. We're at the end of it here in DC and I'm very happy about that. (laughs) Yes. I'm hoping ours are coming to an end too, because it's it's been rough for a couple of weeks there everywhere. (laughs) Okay, so before we get started, I want to hear from you and hear about your background. How did you get to now where you are at NAR? You went to school in the UK, so I would love to hear more about that. I am personally a huge fan of London. I was able to go travel there overseas in 2019, right before the pandemic started. So I would love to hear more about your time there. How did you end up now back in the US and working at NAR? So kind of walk us through a little bit of your background. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been at NAR since 2007, so a really long period of time. And that whole time I've been in the research group and working there, I actually really fell in love with research as an undergrad. And so really just had that as a career, worked at a couple of education nonprofits, and then I found my way to NAR and I just, I fell in love with real estate. I fell in love with housing and just understanding and trying to understand different aspects of it. So yeah, the UK... I, I have a master's degree from uh, American University in public policy, which is in D.C., and that brought me to D.C. originally about nearly 20 years ago. And I, I really wanted a doctorate. I wanted to up my game. I wanted to learn more. I love the research process. So I finally took a dive and did it. And I found the best schools for me were really in the U.K. And so I looked at several and I applied to Nottingham Trent University, and it ended up being a great doctoral program. And it's actually in real estate, which is incredible because there, there's not really too many U.S. programs that are tailored to that. And everyone who works in the real estate fields knows it's really multidisciplinary. It's not just looking at the economics or it's not just looking at sociology or the real estate market or psychology. It's it's everything. And so it was an incredible program for me to be able to do that. So how long then were you in, um, you were in the UK studying and then you came back to the US, I'm assuming after you graduated? So it was a distance learning program. So I, I went to the UK a total of eight times, but it was long weekends generally. So I would 
take the red eye over on Wednesday night. And then I would go to school. Um, I'd, I'd arrive on Thursday, travel to the university. I'd go to school all day Friday, all day Saturday and fly home on Sunday. And so I did it over a course of three years. And several of the times I built in family vacations with those trips to the UK, because if you're there, you, you have to go on vacation. So we had the opportunity to go to London and but also Scotland and Wales and just really enjoyed our time there, too. I love, love London. It's probably one of my favorite cities that I've ever had the pleasure of traveling to. So just talking about it brings back all those memories. So I love a fellow, fellow girl who um, has that appreciation and love for the UK as well. Yes. I, yeah, it was just such an incredible opportunity. And I love Nottingham Trent. They actually asked me recently to be an alumni fellow. And so I'll get to work with current students and kind of mentor them through their programs. But then I'll also have the opportunity, I think this is very cool, I'll have the opportunity to really shape what the real estate programs are and say, is this practical for the real world for students? Like when they actually go into the workforce, is this going to be a practical application of courses? So I'm really excited to still have that tie. And maybe one day I'll get to go back. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, hopefully. I am itching to go back to ever since I've been. And then obviously with the pandemic last year, um, you know, that wasn't an option. I am itching to go back to. I can't wait. You know, it's a six hour flight. It's not not anything (laughs) too crazy. I am so ready to go back. (laughs) But that's awesome. You get the opportunity to shape, you know, the future of real estate, which is like really exciting. You're right. So tell us a little bit about the work that you do at NER. You know, you mentioned that it's a lot on research and analyzing trends. So tell us a little bit about your role at NER and some of the stuff that you do. Yeah. So I am a vice president in the research group and my actual title is demographics and behavioral insights. So I oversee kind of a section of research that looks at what consumers are doing. So how they're behaving in the real estate market, how they're entering the real estate market, who's having problems entering right now. So the first time home buyers out there, those with student loan debt, the minority gap that we see in, in among homeownership rates. And then I also oversee and get to work with the trends among members. And so that's incredibly important too, to see how members are changing and understanding what they need from the association and how they're working in this real estate market, which has been very crazy in the last year. Yeah, very crazy. So much I want to dive into there. So you mentioned first time home buyers, and it's interesting that you said that because in Ohio, we just had a hearing yesterday. We are trying to get a first time home buyer savings bill uh, passed through our legislation right now. And it just had a, a second hearing, I want to say yesterday. So that is something obviously a big priority for us and our members. So tell us a little bit about some of those uh, trends you're seeing there. And what are some of those barriers? You mentioned student loans, but what else are you seeing from that perspective? Yeah, it's such an interesting market right now because we're seeing first time home buyers are at this incredibly low point and the lowest they've been since the 1980s when we had double digit interest rates. So this is a very, very low point for for first time home buyers. But they have great interest rates that they could take advantage of right now. But the affordability constraints and the inventory are very much hurting those buyers. So things like that first time home buyer savings account, that could be a huge boost to first time home buyers to be able to save for a down payment on a home, especially with the affordability crisis that we have right now. So that could be very powerful to be able to allow those first-time buyers to chalk away that money. Because once they know that's where my money is going, one day I'm going to be a homeowner, perhaps in a slightly easier market for them to enter, they'll have that money and ready to go for a down payment on a home and for the closing costs. That could be huge. There was just a study I saw the other day that Millennials are the poorest generation yet to come out based off of where they are and their point of life compared to other generations. So I'm curious, I'm like, is that, you know, does that have something to do with, you know, those first time home buyers and why, you know, that's a problem? But I do think it's a combination, you know, of kind of all of those things. But the interest rates are so low. It's like, you know, you would think that homes are more affordable than ever. But with the market that you mentioned, I mean, it's kind of almost offsetting, you know, the benefits of the low mortgage in its sense. Is that kind of what you're seeing as well? We are. And we're just seeing just the wave of millennials who are aging into a period where they would be a first time home buyer in that age group. But right now they're loaded down with student loan debt. Many of them had jobs that may have had cut hours or even lost wages in last year or may have been laid off. And so they're really grappling with us to be able to save that money. And many of them had to move back home in the last year. Now, for those who are gainfully employed, moving back home could be this huge boost because they didn't have to pay rent and they might have been able to get their student debt into check or other debt that they may have 
But for others, they really are trying to get two feet under them and to really get on the next rung. And that's kind of a new trend, too, is this idea of the multi-generational homes happening again, right? Where you're seeing, you know, grown adults moving back into their childhood homes and back in with their parents. Do you credit that to kind of the pandemic and the things that we witnessed last year, too? Yeah, it was a trend that was on the rise regardless of the pandemic, but the pandemic absolutely accelerated that trend. And we had the largest share of young adults, more than half of young adults were actually at home with their parents. It's the largest share since the Great Depression. That is just like an incredible moment in our history to think that. Now, I do think that right now they might be thinking, okay, where do I go back to that urban center where perhaps my job is, or maybe I'll find a new job in a different area, or I have the savings to be able to actually go buy a home or start renting my apartment again. So we may see them leaving the nest for a second period of time, but there is a growth in multi-generational homes regardless. Aging parents is another big reason why. We saw a lot of aging parents move out of senior centers or nursing homes, assisted living, and into a family member's home. And that trend, I think, may be here to stay. I think they could be in that family member's home for a longer period of time. Very interesting. Very interesting. So while those first-time home buyers and millennials may not be uh, the number one clientele right now, who are buying and selling homes right now? What, is, what does that clientele look like? <sighs> Well, um, well-heeled Americans. So it truly is people who who have that discretionary spending, who have been able to save in the last year. Maybe they're purchasing even a second property. So we have seen a growth in vacation home buying in the last year as well. So people may not be taking that international trip. I know you and I really want to go back to the UK and we'd probably yes. be first on that flight if we felt comfortable with that. But there's a lot of people who are like thinking, let me go buy that lake cabin or that beach house right now because this is someplace where I can go. I might even be able to work there or have my kids do Zoom school if they're not in school full time in the fall. So they they want that flexibility in that second property. And so we're seeing a lot of people purchase those. But for people who are buying their primary residence, it really is people who can compete in this market often with all cash and can really beat out other buyers with higher offers. And, and that's so true, the, the market, and, and we can get you know kind of into that and the craziness that we're experiencing right now, because there is a housing shortage in the U.S. I think we're short maybe like 6 million homes. Was that the latest number mm-hmm. I think I came across somewhere? So that's a lot. How, how can that be resolved? What do you think the timeline is? You know, do you think this is something we're going to see you know, for years or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's going to take a long period of time. We're seeing housing starts in the last few months that they have increased and we are seeing more building, but there's such a supply shortage out there right now of all materials. And so it really has been, lumber has been really well talked about. But if we think about just ordering an appliance in the last few months or or trying to order a piece of furniture or go to the paint store and try and find paint, it's been quite impossible to find any of these materials. And so we know that home building really has suffered, but it suffered for more than the last decade. But what we need to is just people feeling more comfortable that now that they have the vaccine, feeling comfortable if they are a senior and perhaps they were thinking about downsizing, it's okay. Now you have the vaccine and now people are feeling more comfortable and they may want to list their home on the market if they're ready to sell. This episode of The Real View is brought to you by the Ohio Association of Community Colleges. Ohio's network of community colleges provides accessible training that accommodates the busy lifestyles of aspiring real estate professionals at half the price of a traditional university. With convenient locations in every part of the state, as well as online options, Ohio's community colleges are your smart choice for pre-licensing education. For more details or to start the journey to a real estate career, visit the education page at ohiorealtors.org and then click on the pre-licensed course locations. It's a great time because, I mean, these home prices are crazy. And I know specifically in Columbus, Ohio is one of the hottest markets in the country right now. And I mean, you cannot buy a home here in Columbus. And I know many of friends of mine and family members have been trying and, and it is just crazy. Talk to us a little bit about what, what are you seeing in, in Ohio, you know, the Columbus economy being so crazy. How is that compared to the rest of the country? And what are you seeing generally overall in regards to Columbus compared to the rest of the country? Yeah, that was one of the cities that we had named actually in one of the top 10 cities forthcoming for for home buyers who may be entering the market and then certainly for millennial home buyers as well. I think what has happened is that around the country, 
places like New York and Boston and DC, they're always going to be incredibly popular and incredibly hot areas. But there's a lot of people in the last year who said, you know what, I have the ability to move home to my home city, to my home market. And so we have seen a lot of people looking for more affordable cities, but also where their family is. And so we do see that that is a very strong attraction for actually homeowners to actually sell, but then also for buyers to want to move into and and buy a property where their family support system is. Yeah. And I know specifically in Ohio, we are, are, I believe it's our governor has been running intentional campaigns in New York and California, encouraging people to move to Ohio and saying, you know, for what you pay for your, you know, 600 square foot apartment, you're going to get a backyard and, you know, a three story hill for that same price. And I know we are seeing a ton of individuals from out of state kind of move back here and, and, you know, they're saving money, which is crazy. But then I wonder, you know, are, are we pricing out now, you know, some of the individuals that have been here long-term and I look at cities like Cleveland, I know is seeing a huge influx of those out of state buyers. And is there any concern of that with all the moving from different states? Yeah, that is certainly a trend that we are seeing is that even people in California are looking at where can I go? Maybe Arizona, maybe New Mexico, even Idaho, where I can find a more affordable property. As long as it has good broadband access, it doesn't necessarily matter to those buyers how remote that they are getting in some of those states. So this is a trend that we're seeing, but certainly smaller cities have a very strong attraction to buyers because they're saying, you know what, this gives me the affordability, but also the square footage that I might not be able to find in a place like New York City or in Boston or D.C. And with working from home and that kind of being a trend that may stay around, you know, long term, people are able to work from wherever now. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons. And and if you're an out-of-stater, it definitely has an appeal. If you're looking, you know, at, at all of those factors combined, there's there's a good case to, you know, check check something else out. So we talked a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 and and just how that changed who's buying and selling in our market. Are there any other trends or things that we're seeing from COVID-19? And do you think any of that will stay around? I know you mentioned some things you do think will stay around, but is there anything else that you think will stay around? I think that some of the trends we'll have to watch, we'll need to know if they're sticky or not. So I think that the idea of multi-generational homes, I think that's sticky for aging parents to be in that residence. Home offices, as long as CEOs at least give you a couple days out of the week where you are working from home, I think we will want and need quiet spaces where we can have very much a concentration space at home as well as in the office. So I think that idea is here to stay as well. Something else that I think may be interesting and we're starting to see in the data is that, yes, people are going out and they're embracing restaurants and and they're going out to eat again and they're feeling confident doing that. But I think there's a lot of people who went out to eat and they said, oh, man, my food at home is better or I can actually just grab the the second helping if I want it or sit outside. And so I think that we will see the idea of cooking and really embracing that as well in the home kitchen. I think we may see a priority place there. And a lot of homes are are going um, through kitchen remodeling right now. That was one of the biggest COVID kind of uh, remodeling trends when everyone had a moment to sit in their homes and say, where am I living? <laughs> We're not out and about all the time. So that was a big trend too, is that kitchen renovation and seeing, you know, that investment being in some of those more, you know, livable spaces. Yeah, remodeling is hot. And I think it will look down the road 20 years from now and we'll say, oh yeah, that's a home with all the COVID remodeling because we'll just have trends that we'll definitely be able to point out. That's so funny. (laughs) (laughs) All of the peaceful colors will be in those homes, I think. Yes, nice backyards, big kitchens. Mm -hmm. It's going to be interesting to look back on it and say, yep, that was a COVID COVID (laughs) home for sure. (laughs) So you mentioned a little bit too that you you, you do a lot of work and research with the consumer side of things, but also for our members. And you're right, this is such a crazy market. It's a multiple offer market. Homes are flying off the shelf, (laughs) uh, for lack of a better term. So tell us kind of what you're seeing from our members' perspective. Yeah, no, we are hearing a lot of fatigue from our members. It is hard right now to work with a buyer and really try and find them the perfect home. So we've seen in our member data that it has been a hard year, that the number one reason that they're saying that clients are being held back is from inventory. That's not necessarily a surprise, but we are seeing that there's an influx of new members. They're really trying to get their feet under them. 
understand the real estate market and really build out their niche and their clients. Well, more seasoned members in the last year really had to pivot their practice. They had to bring a lot of things virtually, adapt very quickly to COVID-19 and take all the precautions they possibly could to keep all their clients safe and themselves safe. And they really have embraced that. That being said, there's a lot of new realtors in the market. And there's a lot of competition for those homes too, from just a realtor perspective. It's tough. It's crazy. I can't imagine, you know, work, what our members are dealing with, you know, right now it has to just be crazy times. And I mean, is this pace something that is going to stay around? I mean, you, you let, you have to think at some point that it's, you know, the bubble is going to burst or that it's going to uh, kind of calm down at some point. But if you had that magic crystal ball in front of you, what are things we should look out for and things that we could watch maybe in the next two to five years? I think it's impossible to predict a two to five years out right now. I, I will give myself that caveat that <laughs> yes. I don't think we could have imagined five years ago where we would be sitting right now. That being said, our chief economist is predicting and forecasting for the next year that our interest rates will go up for the 30-year effects. And if that does happen, we will probably see some buyers will have to retreat just because they have to with the affordability constraints that they have in the market right now with rising home prices. I'm hopeful that we will have more inventory in the market as people feel confident to either list their homes and feel like now is an okay time or with the housing starts that hopefully we'll have coming into the market. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> that will be a much needed relief for all of our realtors and our home buyers out there, you know, who are who are looking to make that move. So if you had to give just a piece of advice to our members and maybe also to individuals who are hoping to buy a home, what would your advice be to them? Have patience. I think that's the advice that I would give is to for the consumers out there, work with someone who really knows the market well, especially if you're moving a far distance away, which so many people are right now really work with someone who is an expert in that local market because they're going to know the nitty gritty and the ins and outs of that market in a way that most consumers would not. And then for realtors out there, uh, give yourselves a pat on the back and maybe a cup of coffee or a glass of wine because you guys have really been through the ringer in the last year. And hopefully we are seeing the other side of that. So I would say have a little patience and be kind <laughs> to yourselves. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And don't give up too. You know what I mean? Like there may be a lot of no's, you know, in the future or the first couple times you put that offer in, but, but don't give up. And, you know, I'm a big believer in when it's meant to be and when it's right, it'll, it'll happen. So hopefully that will be the case moving forward as well. So is there any last parting words or advice trends you're seeing things that we haven't covered that you'd want to talk about before we wrap it up? No, I mean, I think we covered a ton of ground here. So I'm super excited. I guess the only other trend that I am watching that I, I think is definitely a headline figure right now and very top of mind for a lot of people is birth rates and marriage rates. And so mm -hmm. we've definitely seen a decline in both of those. COVID has impacted them. We very well could be seeing a marriage boom this summer. And so that could be more demand for houses too, unfortunately, for some. But the other thing that we have really seen in this country is a, is a baby bust. A lot of people not feeling comfortable to have a baby or get pregnant during COVID, but also from financial perspective, just so hard to be able to do that this year. So all of these trends are converging at once, but it really does mean different homes as families change and as needs change within that home. Yeah, that's going to be interesting to watch for sure. And I know I was watching news the other day and they said that wedding registries and all those wedding planning sites are up like 40 something percent <laughs> over last year. So uh, the, everyone is feeling much safer and those weddings that may have gotten delayed last year are definitely on and happening <laughs> uh, yes. for the remainder <laughs> of, of 2021 is, is what I think I'm seeing. So <laughs> Yes. Make sure you have your good guest outfit picked out because you might be wearing it to a few weddings this summer. <laughs> I, I was at a wedding a couple of weeks ago and there was a woman at my table who says she has 11 weddings through the remainder of the year. So, <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is a line item in the budget for all of those gifts. Wow. <laughs> So I said, so are you just going to a wedding like every other weekend from now to the end of the year? And she said, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so <Wow>. yes, <laughs> yes. But it's going to be interesting to see, you know, kind of how that how that impacts. And it's definitely a new thought. I mean, people are waiting longer to have children and, you know, waiting longer to get married and maybe not even getting married or not even having children. So you're right. Those trends will be interesting to see how that plays out in, in our industry specifically. So Jessica, thank you so much for being on with us today. This was awesome. So insightful. It was a pleasure talking to you and hopefully we can have you on again soon. 
Yeah, this was awesome. Thank you so much, Allison. (laughs) Thank you. And to all of our listeners, thank you guys for listening and tuning in. We will see you guys next week. Thank you for listening to The Real View. That wraps up today's episode. You can keep up with the latest on the podcast at ohiorealtors.org slash The Real View and on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Have questions, comments, or suggestions? We want to hear from you. Email us at podcast at ohiorealtors.org. We'll see you next time. This has been a Hubble Pod production. Stay humble.